Okay, ladies, I'd like to begin because today I'd like to do something a little bit different than we have been doing in that I want to give you more time to talk, even though I'm stopping your talking right now, but more time later to work through some things at your table together rather than just me doing a lot of the talking. So let's begin and let's start by asking God to be with us today. Dear Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for each of these ladies who are here uh, excited to study your word and to know you better through it. I pray that you would give us hearts that are open and that you would um, speak to us through the Holy Spirit. Help us all to leave here with one uh, truth to hang on to or one change that you'd like us to make today. In Jesus' name, amen. So first, I did want to review a little bit of uh, some of these concepts in the book and then put them into practice a little bit by discussing a passage. So first, though, I wanted to talk about this concept that was in the book about getting a grip because I really liked that illustration. I thought it was memorable. So remember, he said there were five different ways to get into God's word and to get God's word into you so that it can make a change in your life. Without looking, can anyone remember what were those five methods? The truth is, if we thought about it, you would all be able to list these things. But what are the different ways of getting into God's word? Anyone remember some of those? Read is one. Meditate is one. Memorize. Who are we missing? Yes, hearing or listening, and I think I heard it study. Way to go. Nice job, ladies. Okay, so I liked how he described this, and I liked the illustration of the hand because it's a good way to think about it. So he said, first of all, the pinky was hear or listen because of all the methods we're least likely to retain well what we hear, at least compared to the other ways of getting into God's word and getting it into us, right? But we can hear God's word, and we live in a time when we have a lot of opportunities to hear God's word, actually. We obviously should come to church and be hearing God's word and going to Sunday school and hearing God's word. And hopefully in those contexts, we're also studying and thinking and meditating about it, too. But we hear God's word in those settings, but God's given us a lot of technology that allows us to hear God's word. I listen to podcasts. We can listen to sermons. We can even listen to the Bible pretty easily with our phones, or maybe you still listen to the radio. I don't know. It's more podcasts now. But there's lots of opportunities to be listening to God's word, and that's a wonderful thing. But he talked about even better would be to read God's word for ourselves, right? We're a little bit more engaged. And when I compare those two in my life, I know that that's true because I love to listen to audiobooks, like just for fun audiobooks, not always um, Christian literature. But, and I know, especially as an educator, I get a lot more when I actually open a book in front of me and I'm reading through it myself, I'm focused, as opposed to when I'm listening to my audiobooks and I'm folding my laundry and I'm doing the dishes and I enjoy that, I love listening to books that way, but I miss a lot. I'm not as focused, I'm not as engaged. So the reading of God's word helps us to be even more engaged so that he described it as that's this next finger, a little bit longer, it's a little bit more impactful potentially, or it has that ability. And then the tallest would be study, really digging into God's word, spending time really thinking about what is God saying? What are the connections here? How does this apply to my life? Um, really understanding it on a deeper level, going a little slower maybe for the purpose of understanding it and the details and also big picture, little picture, asking questions. So studying would be like the long, tallest finger there, right? And then there's memorization, which for me is the one I often forget. Now, I am thankful I grew up in clubs a lot like we have here, although I did a wanna, And so I memorized growing up dozens and de probably hundreds, hundreds of verses. Memorized them in a moment, though, and recited them. And so there's a lot that's floating up in my memory, and God has used that in a lot of ways. But what I haven't developed is a systematic way of reviewing and purposefully drawing those back out so that I can use them in my life. And that's something that I need to start, um, that I've been challenged on working on. Um, and for that, I think like all of these disciplines, these ways of getting into what God's word, it really just takes 
me saying, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to do it. And I'm going to spend time focusing on that. So memorize, and we all know we need to do that too. Oh, wait, memorize. Where am I? This one. Um, I mean, God's word says, hide, your word in, hide my word in your heart. So we should be doing that, right? And then finally, he talked about meditate. And I liked this description too, because <clears throat> meditate is your thumb, which really works with all of the other uh, ways of getting into God's word, right? Meditation is when we're, when we're hearing God's word, we should be meditating on it and thinking about it. How does this apply? The same as when we read and when we study and when we're memorizing. Because we do know we could be doing all of those things. We could be reading God's word, hearing God's word, studying it, and not really allowing it to go very deep inside us. But meditation is the purposeful trying to listen to God talk to us thinking deeply about what he has to say to us. And that's one of the most important things we can do. Psalm 119, 15, I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. And that's what we want to be doing daily is to be meditating on God's word so that it can dwell in us and it can change us. That's our goal. I think that's what we all desire, right? So as he was talking about meditation, and I think it goes in line with studying God's word, really digging into it today. Um, I wanted to practice getting this grip on scriptures. That's how he described it. How well do we have these things in our life? And do we really have this grip on scripture? Um, so I wanted to take some time to actually go through the one method that this author talked about, and there's many, to dig into God's word and think a little bit more deeply about it. And I wanted us to do it in small groups, okay? So the method that he talked about was the A-E-I-O-U method. I like it because it's easy to remember, it's simple, and you can do it. Anyone can do it, and it's not super hard. So the A-E-I-O-U was you first ask questions about whatever passage you're looking at. In the book, they had you practice. We practice with one verse. I'm going to give us just a little section, and you just ask questions about it. What is it saying? Who is this talking about? Uh, what's the context? Uh, why did they say it this way? Any questions you can think of, anyone can do that. So we ask questions. You look at the key words, especially repeated ideas within a passage. Often scripture is written that way. It emphasizes ideas by repeating phrases or words and to say, this is my main focus. So you look at those and even just things you need to look up. What exactly does this term mean? Or how else is this used in scripture to understand it? In other words would be the I, which can be a useful practice too. It's just putting it in your own words. So rewriting the passage in your own words helps you to think about it on a different level. And then O would be other verses. And that's when you would just, if you have a study Bible, it's like my favorite thing ever. I have an NIV study Bible that my dad gave me um, when I was in high school, I think. And it has the cross references. So it will say this verse connects to this verse and that verse, and you just dig a little bit. What are the connections to what else God's word says on this topic, or maybe even this word, how else is it used? And so you just consider other verses, but many, even if you don't have a study Bible, there's so many tools online where it can help you to make those cross references, concordances are available. And the last thing you, which I don't really like this, but the U stands for you, um, just as an English teacher, that bothers me. We did that with Rush. <laughs> Rush stands for, that's the name of our youth group, are you serving him? And so it just bothers me a little bit, the structure of that. But anyway, <laughs> you for this means you in application. Obviously, anytime we're studying God's word, the whole goal is to walk away with something that God wants us to learn, to understand better, or to change. It's all about uh, God working in us, right? So that's an important part of it, you, the application part. So today, uh, I didn't hand these out ahead because I didn't want you to work ahead. But we're going to do this. <laughs> Did you think you would? I wasn't sure if that was fair. So today we're gonna to look at this passage in John and I wrote it on the sheet of paper so everyone gets one. And we're gonna look at John 15, a parable of Jesus. And we're gonna work through those five, is it five? A-I-A-E-I-O-U. 
uh, and just go through these steps and see, oh, there's a spot over here for you. See what God's word says, but I'm going to have us read it together in just a minute. I've lost you already. Oh, no. <laughs> but the first thing I want to do is, can we just pray one more time and ask God to be with us as we study his word? Dear God, you have graciously given us your word because you desire that we know you and you don't want us to stay as we are. You love us, but you desire us to change, to grow more like you, and that is our hearts as well. And I pray that as we open your word, that you would open our eyes and open our hearts and help us to see the truths that you have for us here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want to read this together so we're not awkwardly, awkwardly all reading it at the same time in our small groups. But then after I read it, we'll go over just the first section together in your groups, okay? And uh, just to set the context real quick, John 15, Jesus has already had the Last Supper. And Judas has just left, already gone, well, a few chapter ago maybe. Judas went to go betray him. Jesus knows what's coming in a matter of hours. And he has these last words that he's sharing with his disciples. And that's where we are here. This is a parable he tells them to help them understand who they are. Because it's going to get really confusing when all of a sudden Jesus is gone. He leaves them. And so this is something that he felt was important for them to know. So let's read this together. Hopefully you all have a sheet. Right? And we can follow along. John 15, 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. So just this first section now, I'm going to give you a few minutes and I want you to discuss as your group and answer these little questions. You really could ask a million questions about this and if you have more, ask them. But work through these. I just picked four questions about that passage. Work through them together, write down some answers and then you will, I'll ask you to share a few things you found. Go ahead and do that now in your group. You're not all finished but you at least had some time to think of it, think about it on your own. So let's see what kind of conclusions we came to. The first question was pretty simple. Who are the main characters in the parable? And the vine, of course, is Jesus. The gardener is God the Father. The branches are believers or even unbelievers, depending on the description, right? Okay, what about the roles and responsibilities of each of those? What is the responsibility of the vine? Provide nourishment, is that what you said? Right, that's where the strength, the energy, everything comes from. <laughs> Stay with us over here, ladies. <laughs> Great, provides life. Life comes through the vine. Yeah. There's been comments about that. How about the gardener? What's the gardener's role? <laughs> Prune. It's pruning. Now, is pruning, does that apply also? Can I use that for cutting down the br dead branches and taking care of that? It's all kind of part of the pruning process. So he's getting rid of the completely dead stuff and even trimming the ones that are alive so that they can produce more fruit, right? That's what we see the gardener doing here. And the branches, what is the role or responsibility of a branch? In this bear fruit. To bear fruit. Yeah. Do you see anything else? Stay connected, remain in him. Those are the two ideas that are connected there. Okay, why is it that the gardener should receive the glory for a fruitful garden? He did all the work, right? He's the one who's 
uh, cleaning, preparing, and um, he is the one who plants, plants, trims. He's the reason that the fruit can grow. What about this last one? How do we show ourselves to be disciples? The very end of that passage talked about. And of course, he was speaking to the original disciples, the OGs. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So how do we show ourselves to be disciples? Bearing much fruit. Abiding in Christ, bearing our fruit. So let's look at some of these ideas then that we saw several times. So we'll go to the next section, emphasize key words. And so you're looking at repeated ideas, repeated words, and then maybe there's something else that stood out to you for some reason. Maybe a word you didn't understand or whatever. So look at those two um, ideas that I highlighted on your paper. Remain or abide is the King James, I think, version of that, abide. So look at abide in me. What are they trying to communicate when I look at that in the context of this parable? Um, what is Jesus saying? And then this bear fruit, what would that really look like? What does that really mean, okay? And then is there any other word or phrase that stood out to you? So talk about those. Take another few minutes in your small group to talk about those. We have to keep moving, so share with me some of the thoughts you had about what it means to remain or abide in Christ. What did you come up with? Grace. What does it mean to remain or to abide in Christ? What do you think? Um, well, it means to just continuously be with Christ and to be with him throughout your day and also like coming to your devotions, not to gain something out of it necessarily, but also just because you love God and you just want to be in his presence. Slay. <laughs> 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 That's not what I meant. <laughs> yes, I love that. The attitude of I'm coming, I'm with God, I'm dwelling with God, and I recognize what my source is. It's a recognition of who I am, and everything that I need comes from Him. Who else? What other things did you discuss when you talked about remaining or abiding in Christ? Any other, uh, maybe, synonyms that you used to describe that? Did you have a really good answer, Sherry? Uh, this is written in my Bible, so I got it from somewhere else, but I don't know. I don't know where. It says to remain in Jesus and abide in Christ. Yes. And to lean on him, listen to him, follow him, depend on him, and live by his words. Yes, I hope you all heard that, because I can't repeat it all. So the highlights of that, I would say, are depending on Christ and living through his strength. And that picture of the vine really helps us to see that. We need Christ in everything. Julie. Right. And I think he's reminding us, too, once we've chosen to be a follower of Christ, then that is our identity. And Christ is with us from then on. And that choice to choose Christ to be a part of his vine is, is a choice that continues. It's not a one time I committed to Christ and it doesn't affect my life forever. It's a continuing to remain in him. It is, and it should define our lives. And I think this was probably poignant for these disciples who just watched one of them who had spent several years with Christ deny Christ and they'll watch him betray Christ and trying to understand that. But Jesus is saying those who might look like they're connected to the vine, if those are pulled away and revealed to be dead, it's because they never were part of it. But those who are true followers of Christ, then we are uh, choosing to rely, remain, and dwell with Christ, and that's a characteristic of our whole lives. 
it's not just a one time. And so that concept is so important. It's a little tricky, but I think God gives us that picture to help us to understand a little better. And what about bearing fruit? That's a lot more familiar and maybe a little easier to explain, but what's this concept of bear fruit? How is that important in this passage? Go ahead, Jean. <laughs> right, we just talked about it. Right, the fruit of the Spirit and this long list of things that when I look at that list, I think I really need to be working on all of them. You know, that's convicting. So bearing fruit. Any other thoughts on bearing fruit? Grace. Being filled with the Holy Spirit and just letting the Holy Spirit lead us in every aspect of our life. Fruit of the Spirit. Do I need to say slay again? No. Okay. But yeah. <laughs> kind of yeah, the fruit of the Spirit, right? We're getting this from the Holy Spirit. It's God's work in us. That's what this whole picture reminds us of. It's always God working in us and through us. And thank goodness, because we know if I know myself, I cannot do what God asked me to do without the help of Jesus. I need the Holy Spirit. I need Jesus. Let's keep going and take two minutes. And this last part, I, well, it's not the last part, but this next section, I want you to do it on your own. And I don't want you, so this is the in other words on your sheet where you try to write this passage in your own words. It really helps you to think about it differently. But I don't want you to write word for word in your own words, as in paraphrase. Don't try to take every concept and write it into your own words. Just general, what are the main ideas in this passage? That's what I'm trying to say, okay? So you're summarizing this in your own words in a few sentences. What is this passage about? Take a minute to do it on your own. I think it might be too difficult to do it together. And those of you who look confused, I'll come talk to you about what I mean. <laughs> well, you got some of it in. But our goal today was just to practice it. So for those of you who didn't quite finish it, you can finish it later. If anyone finished theirs, do you want to share your brief description of this passage? That's OK. You don't need to, because we don't have a whole lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep moving, actually, because, again, today was just to practice some of these steps to say you can do this. It's easy to do if you can set aside a little bit of extra time to do that digging deeper, studying and meditating on this, you can do it. Now, this particular one, in other words, is a challenge for me. I was just sharing that, too, with Samantha. It's hard for me to kind of rewrite it in my own words and simplify it, but it's so good to help you to really understand um, all that the passage is saying at a deeper level. So that's the only reason you do that part. But I wanted to take a minute and look up three verses that are connected to this passage, and some will be very familiar, but how, and maybe thinking a little more deeply about what it means, what some of these concepts mean in this passage. So in other verses, let's do this together in our groups again, look up these verses together, read them out loud, and think about what does this passage say? How does it help me understand this parable of the vine and the branches a little bit better? Go ahead, we got another five minutes. I think I was hearing lots of good discussion, so maybe you're willing to share what are some things that these other verses with similar phrases or ideas, as we compared those, what are some things that you were thinking about or discussing in your group in connection to this picture of the vine and the father as the gardener and the branches? What did these other verses maybe bring to mind? Pruning is like the discipline, and it's an act of love. It's hard to see it that way sometimes while we're in it, but the pruning and the cutting away is how the Father shows that he loves us because he wants us to be in relationship with him, and he wants us to grow to be more like him so we can be in a better relationship with him. So it's for our good. And that's an important reminder when we're going through the hard times. I think of these disciples getting ready to walk into one of the hardest times they'll probably ever have faced. It would have been very confusing and discouraging. And uh, he reminds them, there's a purpose in this. And you're still in the vine. I'm still in you. Um, just remember that. Yeah, so pruning and discipline is an important concept as believers to really understand and to recognize that it's God's love towards us. That's a great point. Anything else that you were talking about in your tables as you were looking at these additional verses? Then let's keep going because we're almost out of time. I gave us too much time at the beginning or I don't know. 
didn't do it very well. So the last one is the most important anyway. You, the application, after we've dug into God's word and we've considered the different aspects, we've compared it to scripture, let scripture speak to scripture. Now, one of the first questions we should ask is, what does this passage teach me about my God? Who is my God? Because this is a story about him, so how can I understand him more deeply? And then I can think, too, what does this teach me about mankind? Or maybe me, but in general, what does that teach me about mankind? So those two questions, I think, are important. Anytime you approach God's word, sometimes that's all I ask myself as I'm doing my reading. Because this type of study is a little more in-depth, takes a little more time. It's not what I do every single time I approach God's word. But when I take time to study, I do always want to, or read, ask, what, what is God trying to tell me about his character, who he is, and what do I see uh, about mankind here, and maybe man's tendencies, our sin nature, or maybe other things, my connection to God. I'd love to do this in small groups, but just tell me out loud what comes to mind, what does this passage teach us about God and who God is? Loving Father. Anything else about our God? Who is our God in this parable? Parable. A perfect parent who disciplines for our good. As parents, we understand that even better than maybe I did when I was a kid. Yes, he loves us and he cares for us. That's who our God is. Anything else? Who is our God that this passage is showing us? He is the ultimate provider for all our needs. I love that description, Julie. He is all that we need, and we need to be remembering that. That takes uh, work on our part to remember who God is. He is our source of strength, our source of everything. Even our source of, if we do anything good, it's because God's working through us. And what do we see about mankind, maybe, in this passage? We are totally dependent on God, right? If we try to act differently or think differently, we're probably not of God. We are completely dependent on God. We need him in everything. Those are two great answers. Take one minute, and I want you to answer those last two on your own, though, because these are exactly how your book described it. This author said, When you look at a passage, ask this, how would you picture God changing your life if you applied this passage? What's one specific way that you could respond to the Holy Spirit within the next 24 hours? Sometimes God speaks to us by saying, I want you to just dwell on who I am. And sometimes God says, you need to change this in your life. Or there could be others in between, but God God's word calls a response from us. He wants us to grow. And so I would just take one minute, think about that on your own, and write down, how has God been speaking to you this morning? Let's respond. Dear Father, I thank you for this time today, and I thank you most of all that you are our Father who loves us and gives us all that we need. And I pray that you'd help us to be relying on you, that we would seek after you. And as we do that, that you would... um, empower us to go out and do the work that you've called us to do. I pray that you uh, would lead us to love others well and bring people into our lives so that we can minister to them and disciple them. And I pray that you would be honored uh, just with our lives, that we would give give them back to you, recognizing that you um, you have given everything to us. All we have is from you. We love you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.